again. They're nice and bright. We are, um, you know, we, we think of Good Friday, we think of the cross, we're reflective. It's, a, it's an evening, of course, of reflection. But even as we enter into the night, uh, while we're here to reflect on the cross, we're sure not here to mourn the death of Jesus. Amen? Because Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. So while we, we gather tonight in remembrance and to reflect on the price that he paid, we do so knowing that we serve a risen Savior who's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's with us always. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. So let's pray and agree together as we open up and enter into this time of reflection this evening. Father, we do thank you on this Good Friday, Lord, that you're, you're with us already as we have gathered in your name. Be glorified this night, we pray. Be glorified as we worship you in song. Be glorified as we worship you through your word, as we take time to reflect on your word and the words that, that uh, Lord Jesus, that you spoke in your, your last moments as you hung on Calvary's cross. May we never forget what you did, the price you paid, and the, how powerful your word is even in our lives. I know we're going to come to a time of remembrance and communion tonight. We trust that it's going to be a great time of remembrance and reflection as we reflect on the price paid on our behalf. So we pray that you would uh, tabernacle among us for a little while, Lord God, now as we begin. Be glorified through all we say, sing, pray, do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. He's good. Amen? Amen. Let's praise him together. Amen. Amen.
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. Then they led him away to crucify him. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Cross this evening, amen? Amen. What a beautiful time of worship. The presence of God is here. I'm so glad you're here on this, this good Friday evening. I do just want to explain a couple of things as we're entering in so you uh, um, kind of know what's happening. You probably picked up a card on the way in that gave you the order of the verses that we're going to walk through. But what we're going to do is seven, uh, we're going to look at each of the seven last sayings of Christ tonight, walking through them one at a time. Don't get too nervous. You say, Pastor, seven different Time someone's going to speak, yes, but they're each going to be brief. They're only going to be 35 to 45 minutes each. That's not true. That's not true. It'll be brief as we walk through. And, and we're going to reflect as we remember the cross that Jesus hung on and died on our behalf. As, as they come, um, I do want to mention to those of you who are sharing this evening, um, we're not going to MC the night and that I'm not going to keep coming back and forth and saying what's next you know when it's time for you to come. You have a schedule as well. So when it's your time to share, if you would just go ahead and come to the front of the room at that time, that'll help our night to uh, flow much more smoothly as well, to, just to be aware of that. We do have a unique guest with us this evening to help us to begin this reflection on the cross this evening, and uh, that's Pastor John Bertram from Christ Fellowship here in Silver Spring, uh, church not too far from ours uh, as well, um, um, over on New Hampshire Avenue, and he is going to begin this journey for us this evening. I don't know if there's other folks in the house tonight from uh, Christ Fellowship or not, but if you are, we welcome you as well. But Pastor John, I want to invite you to come. Can we just give him a welcome as he comes to begin this this evening? Amen. Good evening, y'all. <laughs> Luke 23, 34 says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23 tells us that the crowd that was there, the last time Jesus had been in front of a crowd like this, it had been on Palm Sunday when they were cheering his name, and now the crowd that was there is mocking him and throwing insults at him, and they say, Come on, Jesus. You told us you were God's chosen one. Why don't you save yourself? And hanging on the tree in front of the soldiers, they, they nailed above him was this, uh, here hangs the king of the Jews. This mocking title of his crimes against his own people. And the soldiers mocked him. They're like, your majesty, would you care for some wine? Luke tells us that they offered him vinegar and wine. And you can hear the mocking. He's like, I thought you were the king. Why don't you save yourself? Why don't you demonstrate your kingly powers and save yourself, Jesus? And the mockery continued as they, in front of him, start casting dice for his clothes. He's not going to need them, you can hear them saying. These clothes that had moments before been 
over Jesus, now taken, stripped naked in front of everyone, the humiliation that was there. And you can think in this moment, this moment of unbelievable hatred and anger, of ridicule and mocking and unimaginable pain, Jesus utters these words. And remembering who he is, he starts out a prayer. And he says, Father. And many of us can relate in moments of our own pain. We cry out for those who are close to us, those who we love the most. And here Jesus turns his face to heaven and says, Father. And if it had been you or I hanging on that cross, we would have followed those words with, Father, I want you to remember these people who are hurling these insults to me. I want you to remember them. And I want you to, to take revenge on these people. Yet that's not what Jesus says. Never. We see the truth of who Jesus was, his character, his love, the depth of his forgiveness on display. Because he follows that cry of help, Father, with forgive them. Those two words that are at the center of the gospel message, the center of the truth of who Jesus is, the center of what turns what should have been a bad Friday, a evil Friday, a horrible Friday. These words, forgive them, are what transform today into Good Friday. And those two words have been transforming people time after time, moment after moment. Us in this room reflecting on that truth, forgive them. Because they don't understand the depth of what's going on here. And I would say, guys, we continue to miss the deep truths. And Jesus continues to cry on our behalf, God, forgive them. They don't understand. And so this Good Friday, as we kind of reflect on who Jesus is and and what he did on that cross and what it means to us and why it is, in fact, a Good Friday at the center of it or the heart of it, there are these words in Luke 23. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Amen. 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 I, I'm, I'm not Debbie Alexander. Some of you will have picked up on that. She's actually who was going to share at this time. But unfortunately, um, her family suffered a loss. Her niece died. Um, and uh, Wednesday morning, she texted me. She's had to head to Trinidad to go home. She's where she should be. Uh, she's with her family uh, mourning the loss of her niece and is there uh, for the funeral and things like that. So I'm pinch hitting in her time slot. Now, I know she would do incredibly well, but I assure you we'll get her in in the future on another slot as well. But, but, but consider this next word with me today uh, that Jesus spoke as he hung on the cross. Uh, and it was spoken to the thief that was hanging next to him, you'll recall with me, when he said, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. We've all lost things along the way in our lives. Uh, I've lost things. You've lost things. Sometimes it's not bad to lose something. When I was a kid and I lost a tooth, it was a good thing, right? I would put it under my pillow, and how much money would you get? Did somebody say a big amount of money just now? Yeah, I would get like a quarter when I was a kid. The tooth fairy in my neighborhood didn't have the kind of money that some other tooth fairies had. So I would get like a quarter or whatever. So I didn't mind losing something like that. But I've lost a lot of other things in life as well. I, I lost my class ring from when I graduated. I don't have a clue what happened to it. I wonder sometimes how I lost it or where it ended up in some pawn shop or lost in some dirt somewhere or whatever. I've, I've lost keys. I've lost a cell phone. I lose the remote control. I lose my glasses when they're on my face. Uh, when my kids were little, sometimes I would lose my mind. You can relate to that. So we've all lost things along the way. But Adam and Eve lost paradise. The things I've lost, none of them compare. They lost paradise. 
that word paradise in the Bible, it, it can refer to a, a garden, a, a park with trees type area is what the word really means. And it, it's the word that's used for the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve lived when they were created. They lived in a place that was called paradise. Everything was perfect in that place. They were, they were lacking nothing. It was paradise in the truest sense of the word. There was, there was no sickness in that place. There was no cancer, no disease, uh, uh, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, no, no sore backs. Come on, no, uh, uh, no pain, no, no need for medications. There was no sorrow. There was no stress. There was no financial concerns. There was nothing to, to concern yourself over of, of how this is going to work work out or what's going to happen. It was, it was paradise, and they knew this sinless relationship with their father, with God the Father, where they communed with him. It was paradise in the truest sense of the word. And yet we know the account they gave into temptation. They ate from the fruit that was forbidden, and they were removed from the garden. Paradise was lost. Adam and Eve lost paradise. What a thing to lose. But God gave them a promise. He promised to them when they lost paradise that a descendant would come from Eve and that that descendant would bruise the serpent's head, that serpent being symbolic of Satan himself, would bruise the serpent's head, right? That, that restoration would come, that reconciliation would come, and, and that this would take place. A promise came that paradise would be restored. And when Jesus hung on the cross with a thief hanging next to him, a thief who just moments before had been mocking him, cursing him along with the other one, but now had had this change of heart where he had said, remember me when you're in your father's kingdom. And Jesus said this to him, truly, we would say it like this because we don't really say truly anymore. We would say, I tell you the truth. I'm telling you the truth is what Jesus says to him. I'm telling you the truth. You're going to be with me in, come on, help me paradise. In paradise, he says, Jesus declares that. He was declaring that what was once lost was now restored. Let me read a verse for you. Romans 5, 17. It, this breaks it down from a theological perspective, but hear it with me. Romans 5, 17 says, for if by the trespass of one man, that's Adam, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, we know that sin brought death and separation, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Romans 5, 17. Jesus told the thief words hanging next to him that are as true for you and I today as they were for that thief. The cross restored what was lost. Sin came, but now there was forgiveness. Separation had come, now there was reconciliation. Death had come, now there was life. Paradise was lost, but now the way, the truth, and the life gives us access to the Father once again. Access to both an abundant life in Christ here on earth and in eternity with Jesus where all is made new. Truly, I tell you today, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's as true of us as it was of that thief. What was lost has been restored. Amen? Amen. 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 Far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous.
this attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left His glory above To bear it to dark Calvary So I cherish the church I'm sharing for from the third word of Jesus on the cross which is in John chapter 19 verse 26 and 27 women he is your son and the disciple he is your mother and I want to share two things two thoughts the first one is be responsible of our parents especially when they are older. Jesus, despite the pain and the agony that he was going through, thought of how will be life when he's not around. Yeah. That love that he had for his mom is to teach us as today to take good care of our parents, especially when they're older. Make sure that they are well taken care of. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. And that leads me to the second thought, which is God family. God family. Once we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, once we believe that he shed the blood on the cross for you and for me, that blood flow into our vein, and we become family. Amen. As a church, we are family. That's right. So whether we like it or not, if we call ourselves Christ followers, if we believe that he had shared the blood on the cross for you, for me, for us, so we became family. <coughs> we do know that family is a group of people, like two people, mom, dad, siblings. That's different. But as a believer, as Christ followers, we become family because we share the same blood in our vein. Therefore, we should take good care of one another, pray for one another, look after one another. And this is what Jesus wanted to teach us by saying to John, which was his beloved um, disciple, here is your son to his mom and to the disciple, here is your mother. Yeah. 
So if you are out there tonight and you think that your family is far away, you feel lonely, you don't know who to turn to, I want to tell you tonight that you can turn to me because I'm your family. Amen. We believe in Jesus. Amen. You can turn to your neighbor sitting on the right or on the left side of you and talk to him as your own family. We are family once we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. May God bless you. Amen. So the next verse is uh, in Matthew chapter 27, verses 46. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakatan. Or Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakatan. These are the words that Jesus spoke. I want you to picture this. For three hours, there was darkness. And there was no word from Christ. He was silent for three hours. Darkness is a symbol of judgment. You read that in Exodus chapter 10, verse 22. When God spoke to Moses that you will lift up your hand and that there will be darkness yeah. for three days. You also see that in the book of Amos chapter 8 verses 9. As well as the book of Joel chapter 2 verses 2. Darkness is a symbol of judgment. Jesus stayed in silence for this period. And he who knew no sin carried our sins. Jesus was made sin for us. We read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 21. He was made a curse for us. We look at that in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13. God the Father poured his wrath on his son. The son that was dying as a sacrifice, he was deserted, rejected, abandoned, and felt extremely lonely. He experienced agony. And in quoting Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus cried out, My father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? Or in Hebrew, Eli, Eli, lama sabakatan. It was a very painful experience. The one, that he, the one that he did not want to take. But he took the bullet for you and for me. Amen. This is a demonstration of God's love for us. And you do not have, my sister just talked about feeling lonely. You do not have to feel lonely. Because Jesus, in that space, he felt lonely. He felt rejected. So that we can be accepted. Amen. In Romans chapter 8 verses 38 to 39 says, I am convinced or I am persuaded in other versions that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate me from the love of of God, who is Christ Jesus. During that time, Christ was reconciling us to, to the Father. He was reconciling us to the Father so that we should not feel rejected, we should not feel deserted, we should not feel lonely, but be accepted in the face of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God, 
is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. God is with us. The God I am is with us. And so cheer up and embrace the love of God that he gives us. May God bless you. It was a Friday, early morning. While the sun was still sleeping, Jesus was cheated, arrested for no reason but treason in men's hearts. And just like that, it starts. It was an unjust Friday. Six trials, nothing sticking, priests punching, judges kicking, slinging lies at infinity, beating down on divinity who, by grace, did not speak obedient, meek. It was a painful Friday as daylight tumbled in, whips ripped the skin of the one who healed a thousand wounds. The one whose soul was right and true, left in shreds for something he did not do. It was an ugly Friday. The clawing crowd, when given a choice, let villain fly in single voice. But when Jesus' name was lifted high, could find no word but crucify, crucify. It was a bloody Friday filled with nails and wood and a man who would do what God only could, arms open wide, good enough to die for the very people who hung him out and bled him dry. It was a dark Friday a shout to the sky, a spear in the side. Two Marys start to cry as angry earth trembles and black clouds swell quietly. Jesus goes through hell, dying in our place, dying well on Friday, Good Friday. How is it a day of such evil and pain ever got the word good in its name? This day of infamy, human villainy, when the world showed off its most evil face because there, in that blood-stained place, when they pulled the body down like seed to ground, the author of life sprouted roots of grace that would once and for all save the human race. This victory death, a complete surprise as demons and devils with fear in their eyes realized that once a perfect man died, the law was finally satisfied. No more striving, no more trying, no more guilt, no more dying. The man who lived the way we should died the way only God could. And that's why we call this Friday good. The day Christ fell is the day mercy stood. So hold your faith, lift your praise, and remember, as good as Friday is, Easter, is still on the way, hope rising forever in three more days, three more days. Three more days. Amen, amen. I am going to speak on the fifth word that Jesus spoke on the cross. Like Brother Tobias said, many hours had gone by. He had gone through so many things um, from the beginning. These words are not just historical words. So this whole event that we're gathering today to remember Good Friday, it's not just a historical event that stayed in the past but it's a truth that's gonna resonate and resonates in our lives today. John 19, 28, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said the words, I thirst. Now, there's a lot of context that we can get out of these two words that Jesus spoke. First, the immediate one was the physical moment he was going through. We know that Jesus was 100% man and he was 100% human. 
Jesus suffered. He felt pain. And we know also that even, even before hanging on the cross, Jesus was offered liquid. Jesus was offered something to drink. But Jesus didn't say these words just for the physical need of water that he had. See, I learned while studying the, this that what he, the liquid that he was offered was wine mixed with vinegar. It wasn't just a coincidence that somebody had it. See, when the people were being crucified, it was a very painful moment to go through. So they would offer this wine and vinegar to them to numb the pain a little bit. Or, or they were going to die, but at least they, it would numb a little bit of it. But Jesus didn't want a temporarily relief for what he was longing for. He said, I thirst. So there's much more than the words than just a physical need of water. The cry, I thirst, secondly, also fulfills a prophetic word. Actually, all of these words, Jesus didn't just speak just to speak them or just because he was feeling them. But they were, uh, um, they were a prophecy being fulfilled. And he wanted to speak them for many reasons, for us now, but for also the people that were there. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the word. And as they were hearing this, I'm sure some remembered Psalm 22. My mouth is dried up like a phosphor, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Psalms 22, 15. Everything was written. Nothing happened for coincidence. Everything that happened and every word that Jesus said on the cross was a fulfillment of a prophecy, was a fulfillment of the law. So throughout the Bible, we also um, read a lot about thirst. It's often used as a metaphor for longing, for longing something that you're lacking of. The Psalm, in Psalms 42, 1, 2, we can read, as the deer pants for stream of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said, I am thirsty. He was teaching us. Just like we've, we've heard, he, Jesus taught us so many things. And in this occasion, he was teaching us, come to God. If you're lacking something, if you're longing for something, come to him. Because God, he gives us an everlasting healing. He gives us an everlasting fulfillment. Not something temporary like vinegar and wine that will numb us a little bit. But sometimes we go for those things. Sometimes we're suffering so much, we're lacking so much, we're losing so much, and we want to fulfill it with temporary things. Now, long story short, in my life, I lost a lot of things in my life. My parents got divorced. I lost being in a, in a, in a family. Then I was sent to El Salvador with my aunt, and my aunt di died. And then my aunt died, and I was sent to my grandfather, my grandmother, and my grandmother died. Oh, I felt so empty by a, such a young age. Then my grandmother died, and I was sent back to my dad with my sister, all of this. But then my sister want, want, wanted to study here in the United States, so she left, and then I just felt alone. And in my youth years, I was accepting that wine mixed with vinegar because I just wanted to numb my loneliness, my lack of fulfillment in my heart and in my, my social life, my family life. So I, I went through, 
I tried so many things and I was with the wrong people. I was drinking the wrong water, trying to keep fulfilled. But at the end of the night, that numbness, that, 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 that fulfillment that I thought was going to make me forget all the, 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 the loss that I have gone through, and I will feel it again and again and again and again each night, each day. And it wasn't until, it wasn't until God had a mercy in my life and through, through many um, um, brothers and sisters like Sister Elizabeth was, was, um, was saying, they came to me as family and they presented me to Jesus. And I came to the cross. And it was not until then that I felt a fulfillment of what in my whole life I was lacking of. And God changed me. God changed my past. God changed my future. I met my husband. I'm, I'm waiting for a new baby, my second baby. And God fulfilled me with not a temporary happiness, but with a happiness, with a joy, with a joy that I feel all the time in my life. And he could do the same for you. Amen. Second Corinthians to close 4, 16, 18. Therefore, do not lose heart. Before Jesus said, I thirst, we heard Brother Tobiah said, he, he, Jesus said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? But he didn't stay there. He wanted to teach us. And in those nights, in those moments, whatever you are going through, that you may, you, may, you may even say similar words, God, where are you? God, where are you? God wants you to long for him, to thirst for him, to seek him, because he will give you the, the way. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 8, 16, 18, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outerly we are wasting away, another version said, even though our bodies are dying, yet inwardly from the inside we are being renewed every day. Jesus in many occasions said, I am the living water, the water that never stops. God's blessings never stop. For our light and momentary, momentary troubles are achieving for us an, etern an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. Amen. God bless. Hello, church. The sixth word of the Lord is, it is finished. John 19, verse 30. It is finished. Three words. The period after those words signifies a finality, an end. So when I was getting ready to prepare my sermon, I looked up the word finished. And the word that came up, the Greek equivalent was paid in full. And I think, Pastor, you talked about that a couple of Sundays ago. So I said, okay, let God, let's break this down. So John 19, verse 30 says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. There are three things I would like to, I would like you guys to catch. The Bible in verse 29 states that, a soaked sponge of wine vinegar, which Melissa just mentioned, was placed on the stalk of a hyssop plant. This is significant because the hyssop plant was used as a seal, a covenant for God's people. So in, I think it was Exodus, or Genesis is Exodus, um, Exodus actually, when the children of Israel, the angel of death was passing over the, the Egyptians, God ordered his, his people basically to dip a hyssop plant 
and then in blood, and then, yeah, yeah like basically smeared across the doors for the, for the angel of death to, tr to pass over them. So it was a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement. It's, it's a contract. And so this means that the contract that Jesus made with us was for him to die for us. He's a covenant-keeping God, so that's the first thing. God is a covenant-keeping God. The contract that he made with us was for him to die for us so that we might have life and have it abundantly. That is the consideration. So when we accept or assent to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we also walk in the tenets of his word, we listen to the Bible and what he has to say, we have then formed an agreement to be under the covenant. So if we are now in agreement, then the provisions that were made under the covenant are now available to us. Amen? So this new covenant comes with a promise that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to die for us. And there's a condition, which is for us to live upright in his love. Amen? So this means that in his covenant, then, we find all the promises, such as perfect peace. Isaiah 26, verse 2. In his covenant, we find rest. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 29. But in his covenant, we find peace. And, less, uh, and, and just some um, strength. In Isaiah 40, verse 30, he will give us, he will renew our strength. Amen. The second thing I would like to point out, the second lesson in this, it is finished, is what is the it? And so when I was ruminating, the Bible said I was racking for things to say. What is it, it, it? And just as the, the legal undertow of it um, read its head again. And in legal, in a legalese, I'm a lawyer, so I usually go back to that. But in legalese, there's this thing called in toto, which means the whole. So I-T, it, in toto. This means that through Jesus' death, he has brought an end to and paid in full the whole gamut of our sinful nature. Amen? Amen? So all of our iniquities, our sinful nature, our wickedness, immorality, that has been paid for in full. So the hyssop, which I mentioned earlier, is not only a symbol of a covenant, it's also a rite of purification. This means then that... When the Bible says that whom the Son sets free is free indeed, indeed we are free. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen? So that means our transgression, our wrongs, all of that has been taken away in total. Our barrenness has been taken or cured in total amen our peace now reigns in total worth god has wor has lavished worth on us in total we lack nothing in spiritual mental financial emotional personal he has made sure that we have everything that we need and lastly the bible says that christ gave up his spirit the Greek word used to describe this is paradidomi, which means to give into the hands of, to surrender. So, Jesus gave over his life to the Father so that we can give over our lives to him. The Father and the Holy Spirit as well. So when we surrender, we relinquish control and we say, God, let your will be done. Amen. When the storms of life come, and they surely will, we must always remember that when we come to Christ, we relinquish fear. We relinquish our natural tendencies to control things. We relinquish our worries, our anxieties, the, the stresses, the vicissitudes of life. We, we, we relinquish all these things, and we hand it over to God to manage and handle for us. Amen? So sometimes it's hard to conceptualize that it is finished. When we're in the midst or in the thick of it, when we are still sick, when we don't have any money. But tonight, I'm, I'm encouraging anyone that, uh, I'm encouraging everyone to 
Remember what the Bible said that we should taste and see that the Lord is good, that blessed is the man that trusts in him. So tonight I encourage you all to ruminate on his last words. It is finished. And really believe that in total, it is finished. Amen. A voice whispers, look at what you've done. We are marked by a lifetime of selfish choices, a legacy of harsh words, terrible thoughts. Look at what you've done, the constant jealousy, the envy of what others possess, the disregard for people in the pursuit of what we desire, what we insist we are entitled to. The enemy whispers, look at what you've done, hiding our addictions, telling lies to ourselves, to our spouses, to our friends, convincing the world that we are fine while we are breaking into pieces. Look at what you've done, medicating our emptiness with screens and swipes, entertaining ourselves with the wicked, the indecent, the disturbing, feeding on luxury while forgetting the poor. Satan whispers, look at what you've done. The betrayal of our own beliefs, from hype to hypocrisy, building the walls of our own kingdom, loving darkness more than light. Look at what you've done, the bitterness, the gossip, the brooding, the prejudice, the enemy is gloating. Look at what you've done, look at all your shame, look at all your guilt, look at all your chains, look at what you've done. You deserve wrath, you deserve hell, you deserve death, look at what you've done. And really, he's right. That is what we've done. But to every whisper, to every accusation, we remind the enemy of Jesus. And we say, look at what he's done. He commanded the universe into being. Light emerged from his voice, that's what he's done. He scripted the totality of time and he wrote his glory into every line, that's what he's done. He stepped down from heaven, took on our flesh, he humbled himself becoming obedient to death, that's what he's done. Forgiving our sins, that's what he's done. Dying in our place, that's what he's done. He was dead, buried, but then he rose from the grave. That's what he's done. Death defeated, hell scorned, debt paid, veil torn. No matter our past, Jesus has overcome. The dead are alive. That's what he's done. you thankful for Jesus? Amen. Hey, there's one final word that Jesus spoke on the cross. It's found in Luke chapter number 23, verse number 46, the last of his seven words when Jesus spoke the words, Father, into your hands or into thy hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46. The first words that Jesus spoke when he hung on the cross is, Pastor John pointed out to us the first word out of his mouth was Father, and, and the last thing he would say would once again, uh, he would speak to God as his Father. Uh, even as he had begun, Father, forgive them, he would, he would start the same here as well. I, I spoke before uh, of something being lost, of how paradise was lost when Adam and Eve fell. Um, you've, you've lost things along the way, as I mentioned, but you've probably also had something taken from you at some point in your life, something that was stolen, something that was removed, something that was unjustly lost. Melissa, uh, when she shared, spoke of things that uh, we could easily view as were taken from her, lives taken, st stability taken in her life. She didn't lose it. It was no fault of her own, but these things happen, and uh, it happens to us along the way as well. When 
when uh, someone um, uh, kills another individual. We even use that word take. We say they took their life. You, you took their life from them. The life was stolen. The life was taken. But it's important to remember as we come to this last word that no one took Jesus' life. Jesus' life was very different than other lives that were lost. No, uh, not those who put him on trial, not the Jewish Sanhedrin, not the Roman government, not Judas who betrayed him. Jesus said that he laid his life down. Jesus chose to surrender his life. His life was not taken. His life was given, given on our behalf. And Jesus, who said this, he died on a cross, of course, as we know, on a hill we called Calvary because he chose to give it up. His, his final words reflect on this. And in fact, his final words reflect that Jesus was in complete control to the very end. Uh, Jesus is who's calling the shots, not the Romans, not the Jewish leaders. Jesus is who is, is who is fulfilling the prophecies. Jesus is who is walking through this and laying his own life down. And, and his last words, Jesus still well demonstrates. We know Jesus, come on, as he said to Peter in the garden, he could call on his father for legions of angels if he wanted. But this is Jesus' plan. Jesus is the lamb who was slain, come on, for went from the foundations of the earth. It was always the plan. And Jesus' last words reflect this. He's still in control. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, the verse says, he breathed his last and he died. The plan was complete. The prophecies were fulfilled. Our sins were now paid for. There was nothing left to do. Jesus' final prayer demonstrates, or his final words demonstrate a couple of things. It was a final prayer. It demonstrates a couple of significant things to us, but one primary one that I, I want to pull these thoughts together with tonight, and that is this, Calvary worked. The cross worked. It's so important to know that. This past Christmas, I, I pulled all of the lights out from the basement where we store them and I strung them out across the front yard that I hang with these gutter clips and having learned my lesson along the way I've I've become a little wiser in the hanging of the lights because somehow the lights all worked fine when I took them down last year after Christmas but when I pull them out the next year what happens gnomes or something or the neighbors sneak into my house while I'm not home I don't know what happened but they mess with them and so I, I lined them up along the front yard first and and all lined up I put the plug in and and it was like a Christmas miracle they all came on and I was like hallelujah this is amazing and and then I got my ladder out and and I hung like hundreds of these little clips that hook all along the gutter of the front of the house and I'm out there and I string the lights all the way along and and I've got it level and it's all in place and I'm so pleased and I go over with the cord and I plug it in and guess what happened <laughs> nothing nothing they didn't work sometimes things just don't work sometimes you buy something brand new and plug it in and it doesn't work Sometimes you put something together and you think it's going to be just right and it doesn't work. Sometimes you make a plan at work, at school, whatever it is, in a relationship, and it, and it just doesn't work. Sometimes things don't work and it can be frustrating and hurtful, but that didn't happen with the cross. The cross worked. Jesus' spirit could be, could be committed to the Father because Father had accepted the sacrifice. Remember, Jesus died as it been, has been spoken of throughout this evening as a payment for our sin. Our sins were taken off of us. They were placed on him, but no sin can be in the presence of God. Remember that God is holy. There will be no sin in his presence. But once Jesus dies, after showing himself to his followers, for a period of 40 days, he's going to ascend back to heaven, right? To be seated at the right hand of the Father. But if my sins and your sins are still on Jesus, he can't go back. He can't go back. Because he would now be evil. He would now be sinful. Jesus knows that he can return. He can pray, Father, into your hands. 
I commit my spirit. I'm coming home because Jesus knows something. It worked. It worked. The sins have all been paid for. They've all been washed away. Calvary covers it all. The Father accepted the sacrifice as payment for our sins, praise God. Imagine you went to a store when you left here and you walked in and you went through and you picked something and you walk up and you set it on the counter or even went to the self-checkout as so many of them are now. But wherever you are, you paid for what you had. Maybe you paid with a card. Maybe you paid with your Apple Pay because you're high tech. Maybe you had cash with you. Maybe I was in the grocery store a couple of weeks ago and the lady in front of me in line pulled out this little booklet and she wrote some things down on a piece of paper to pay for her groceries. I don't know what it was. I have some vague memory of seeing that years ago, but it's been so long. I was like, wow, they still take checks and they really do. It doesn't matter what the method is. Once you've done and once you have paid it, you pick up your items and you walk out. Why? Because it's been paid. It's done. You don't ask the clerk, can I have this now? They'll say, what do you mean? It's yours. You already paid for that. The transaction is complete. You don't have to wonder now whether you can leave with it. It's already been paid for. Just the same as it will never happen for the child of God that I need to have any doubt that one day when I leave this life that I would step into the presence of God. I won't have to step in wondering. I wonder if my sins were really paid for. I wonder if they were really covered. I wonder if I'm really getting in. No, this tells me Calvary worked. It worked. The price was paid. Jesus doesn't still have those sins on him, but your sins were placed on him, my sins were placed on him, and now they've all been washed away. They've been cleansed. The blood was sufficient sacrifice. The wages of sin, which are death, were paid for. When he breathed his last Calvary work, praise God. Jesus could tell the thief, Today you will be in paradise with me because Jesus knew something. This is going to work. This is going to pay the price. And it did. It still works. It still works. It always will. If you've called on Jesus, if you've said, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. If you've, if you've done that, then you know it worked. It worked. And if you haven't done that, you might be watching online or in this room. If you haven't done that, I have good news. It works. It works. Would he really forgive me? It works. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus knew it's all done. The price was paid. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going we're gonna to partake of communion in just a moment, but first let's watch this together.
just kind of wave your hand and usher will make sure we get one in your hand. You don't have to have been here before to have communion with us before. Uh, any, uh, we would like for everyone to participate with us in this way. Uh, if you say, well, the, the only condition that the Bible puts on uh, partaking of communion is that you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And I hope that we all are, but if you are not, this would be a good time to become one. I did see one hand over here wave kind of in the middle. Ushers, if you could help us out. Thanks so much. Amen. Make sure they see where you are. They'll get that right to you. is a time of, of remembering. It's a time of reflection. Tonight in particular, it's a time when we remember the cross. Jesus would have actually had communion the day before the cross. He had communion on the Thursday at, at the Passover feast. Uh, the next day would be, of course, when he would be, um, the trials would take place and he would head to the cross. And, and at that uh, communion time, as we call it now, at that Passover feast, we know that when Jesus was there, he, he took off his outer garment, he tied an apron around his waist, and he washed the feet of his disciples who were there. And he told them, I, I give you a new commandment, a new commandment I give you today, that you love one another. And even as I have loved you, so you love one another. Tasha reflected on that some this evening as she talked about the family of God that we come into, that, that we love each other as we come in. Communion reminds us of what Jesus did, but communion also reminds us that we're the family of God. Amen? We're the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. He redeemed us into a family. We remember that this evening as well. Hallelujah. Just before we partake, I just want to give you a moment to pause and reflect. To pray on your own if you would like and you can allow God to search your heart. This could be a good time to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. It may be a time to pray a prayer of confession. Whatever it is you need to pray, just take a moment and look to him as we come to the, to the communion table. tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me the bread reminds us reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ that it was torn that it was broken on our behalf amen Right, would you lead us in prayer for the bread and let's give thanks. Jesus gave thanks that night, amen. Let's give thanks for what Christ did. Lord, we thank you, we honor you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What love, what love that you gave your life for each one of us, Lord God. Because of you, I'm walking freely. Because of you, I'm healed. Because of you, I thirst no more. Because of you, it's by grace, Lord God, that I'm standing here. You have set a path for me. You have set a path for each one of us, Lord God. Help us to always look up on you, Lord God, and remember what you have done. By your grace, by your mercy, we are standing, Lord. No by sight, no by sight, but by faith. God, help us to always remember that, Lord Jesus. You gave your life so I could be saved. You gave your life so my family could be saved, so my neighbors could be saved, so my co-workers could be saved, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We don't deserve it, Lord God. We don't deserve it, but you freely, freely you gave your life for us, Father God. And we thank you, Lord God. Thank you, 
Jesus. Help us to always, every day of our lives, remember what you have done and be thankful, Lord God. In the difficult times, in the happy times, we will remember to walk with you, to honor you, to bless you for who you are, to bless you because you are the the I am that I am, Lord God. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my healer, my all in all. That's what you are, Lord God. And you gave it all for me. You gave it all for us, Lord God. Thank you for, for your body broken for us, Lord God. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But every day, Lord God, we sin, we fall away. But you are there with open arms to reach us again and again and again. Your mercy is everlasting, Lord God. And we say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Lord God, for what you have done, for what you continue to do, and what you always will do for us. Thank you for saving us, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, you bless the bread as we partake of it together. Let's take the bread. to read in verse 25 in 1 Corinthians 11 it says in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes hallelujah Jesus gave his life for us amen but Jesse, if you'd lead us in prayer for the cup as we come to it before we partake of it together. Amen. I want everyone to just close your eyes. Close your eyes for a moment. And just picture yourself that you were at the table with Jesus Christ. And he's telling you that this is the last time that I would be with you. I'm giving you something to remember me by. I'm telling you that if you drink this blood, this cup, I will always be with you. And I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. No matter what you are going through, no matter what the trials or the tests may be, before I go to the cross, I'm telling you that I will be with you and that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as you drink this cup, I want you to understand that I am joining you together with me. And you can never be separated from me because we are one. We are one. And as I go to prepare that place for you, I want you to understand that this cup will always represent my blood, that I shed it for you, that you may have life, and that you will have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. I want to speak some words of thanksgiving to him. Thank him for what he's done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On your way out, I'm going to ask that you would drop your cups off with an usher. If you'd not leave them at your seat, they're going to be at the door. And uh, there's a couple of other things, actually, that are going to be available in the lobby as you leave today. There's... Um, there's some bread that's available that we're going to be giving away, some challah bread that was donated to us, and you can pick up those loaves and take them with you on the way out. It is delicious. I got some early, and uh, we've got a lot of it um, that, that's going to be out there, and also some door hangers that you can use to invite your neighbors and folks to Easter Sunday along with um, uh, the egg hunt that's coming up. You'll be able to, you can hang those on doors in your neighborhood, and 
Uh, if you're willing to distribute those, they're available in the lobby as well. But just before you walk out, would you stand with me? Let's sink through this once before we go, before we slip out too quick. It's been a wonderful night of remembrance. Amen. Lead us in this team. Let's sing this through and then we'll depart. In Christ alone. My hope is found. Yes. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone.